26 November 2023, the truth behind the widow's offering by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. May you find this message inspiring and uplifting and I pray that you will be receptive to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray even as we listen to your word, Lord, that you will help me to speak the truth without error, that you'll help your children to get the gist of what you want them to know, and that they will apply this word, that they will be doers and not just hearers of the word. We ask you for your blessing on every aspect of this word, now and whenever it is viewed or heard. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. The truth behind the widow's offering. The truth behind the widow's offering. Our reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box or the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting two small copper coins. These copper coins was worth, worth less than a penny. And he said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. In other words, more than all the rich. For they all, the rich, contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. They gave a little bit of their abundance. She put in everything she had to live on. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Jesus was at the temple observing people putting their offerings into the treasury. Many rich people were there, giving large amounts of money, making a show of it. But a poor widow came to the offering box, took out two small copper coins from a little bag she had, and dropped it into the treasury. Now Jesus saw this and he told his disciples that she had given more than the others because she had given everything she had. Now this story is often used to illustrate the principle of sacrificial giving and the value of a sincere heart in giving to the work of God. It is used many times by many people to motivate the Christian to give and to give. Sometimes some, I've heard people say, give till it hurts. And Jesus praised the widow for her faith and her generosity, contrasting her genuine giving with the hypocrisy hip, hip, Hypocritical scribes, Pharisees, leaders who love to show off their wealth and status. Now, while that flavor of the story is not wrong, while what people tell you is that, while what people tell you is that God, Jesus, commended the widow, that's not wrong. And Jesus loves the cheerful giver. And if you want to give, he is happy. For you to give if you give cheerfully but once whilst that flavor is not wrong I want to present what I think is the real message behind this I want to look at the context in which Jesus speaks of this in which Jesus says these words and I believe that Jesus words at the Treasury had a deeper message that he had started preaching long before he sat in the temple and watched the people putting their money into the treasury. Now let us re retrace Jesus' steps to find out what was in the mind of God in the days before he commended the widow and castigated the rich. A few events that took place in the weeks preceding the passion of Jesus pointed to what Jesus said about the widow and the rich tithers. At face value, these events may not may seem unconnected to the story of the widow's might or the widow's offering. However, when one looks at Jesus' ministry as a whole, the lesson becomes clear. The lesson is a revelation concerning money in the context of Christian worship. And I'd like you to listen carefully to what I'm saying. I'm trying to keep my sermons short so that they are easily uploaded to multi-platforms. We will examine those events before we reconsider 
which I'm asking you to do, to reconsider the commonly held view of the widow's offering. The events we will re-examine are, one, Jesus and the rich young ruler, two, the cleansing of the temple, three, his view on paying taxes, and three, and four, sorry, his rebuke of the scribes and the Pharisees. And all these stories come before the widow's offering. After seeing the rich young ruler's reaction, Jesus commented that it was difficult for a rich person who valued the money above all else to follow him. You will remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you must follow the law. You must be born again. And the, and, and the man said, I do all these things. I love my neighbor as myself. I do charity. I do this, this and the other. And Jesus said, because Jesus could see into his heart and Jesus said, go and sell all that you have. It, it wasn't, Jesus wasn't asked, uh, really telling him to sell everything. Jesus was testing him. And the man left Jesus very upset. You see, he valued his money more than he valued eternal life. Money had become a stumbling block to his salvation and service to God. And I want, to keep, want you to keep this in mind. Number one, money had become a stumbling block to this man's salvation and his service to God. He thought he could do a little bit here and there and, and he would go to heaven. And it wasn't that God, Jesus was saying he won't go to heaven. Jesus was pointing out that the rich people, the rich people's money becomes a stumbling block because they, although they do a little bit of charity, they do it because they can out of their abundance. But they do not do it. They are not prepared to let it all go for Jesus. The second one, the next event that had disappointed Jesus was the way that the temple had become a marketplace. Instead of meeting spiritual needs, the leaders of the temple, the leaders of the synagogue had allowed the temple to become a place that met financial needs from being a sanctuary that had now become a marketplace. An infuriated Jesus drove out the money changers and sellers of sacrifice animals. Jesus got the heat. When he saw this, his, the zeal for the, his father's home or house consumed him. He, he kicked over the tables or he upturned the tables. He, he, had a, he made a cord of, a whip of cords. And he drove out the animals. No, Jesus didn't whip the people. He drove out the animals. Jesus was very disappointed that the house that he wanted us to worship at had now become a marketplace. And many times when we look at our churches, we have become a marketplace. We are selling, we pastors are selling miracles, selling miracles. We are not telling you, come and give us something, we'll give you something back, although some of them are doing that. But we tend, we've made it almost as a marketplace where people come, the bigger tithe, uh, tithers get more benefit of the pastor. The bigger tithe, tithers tend to have more of the pastor's year. Okay? You know, I've heard of people are, uh, uh, praying uh, for, you know, a special prayer if you give so much a donation. And we have made, and the many men of God and women of God, women have also entered this arena. It's very really lucrative, really, if you can speak. And they are uh, extracting money. That's the way I say. They're picking the pockets of the faithful. And many people are stupid enough to believe that you can buy salvation. Number three, his enemies tried to trick him into trouble by questioning whether a heavenly minded people should pay an earthly tax. You would remember the, the issue where the tax collectors wanted the money. The, it was, you know, the, the Caesar tax, if you remember the story. And somebody came, they sent somebody to ask Jesus, Master, hey, you know what, they were very, very subtle about it. Very conniving, Master, we acknowledge you are a rabbi. Tell us, do we, do we need to pay a tax to Caesar? Because we belong to a heavenly kingdom. And Jesus pointed out that one's earthly obligations can harmoniously coexist with one's spiritual values. 
It does not mean that just because you're a follower of Christ, a Christian, you should, you should not pay your taxes and you should not do the things that require, you are required to by the law. Okay? One should not use religion as an excuse to break the law. And this is what they wanted to get from Jesus. If Jesus said, don't pay the taxes, they would have gone outside and told the tax collectors, here is a man who refuses to pay taxes and he's teaching others. And Jesus would have been arrested before his time and for the wrong reason. And if Jesus said, pay it, then they would have said, oh, but you are not showing any value for the kingdom of God. So Jesus gave them a fantastic answer. He said, whose inscription is on that coin? And they said, Caesar's. He said, well, give Caesar what is his and give God what is his. You see, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. Finally, the fourth incident, Jesus severely rebuked the hypocritical the hypocritical religious leaders who use the law for control and power over the people. You remember the Bible says they teach for the commandments of God, the traditions of men. These people were so, so legalistic. If I planted, if my wife had 10 plants like this in the garden, she had to sell one of these plants and take the money and give it to the treasury. If she had time in a garden, she had to... When she bundled them, she had to sell one tenth of the time and put the money into the church. And, uh, and that is what they did. They pushed the time. They enforced the time. But they didn't care about people who were suffering. And that is where we will find these, all these things culminate. They meet, they intersect in the life and the, of the widow and the event where the widow puts in the last money that she had just get this thing up again yes sorry yes okay now it was easy for the rich to meet an obligation of the tithe because they had much and giving is a good practice. Giving is a good practice. Okay. Jesus now, Jesus was not averse to giving money to the churches. Jesus was not averse to money. He had no problem with money. He had a problem with the inordinate love of money. In fact, Jesus had a treasurer. Remember Judas. Judas was the treasurer. So Jesus knew money and he knew that money was necessary for living, but money is not necessary for life. I'll come to that. The leaders, however, loved money and by their legalistic attitude gave the impression that money was necessary for life, eternal life. See, if you didn't pay your tithe, you were not going to heaven. Recently, I, I, I asked somebody, a little congregation, and I said, what are the most important things that you need to do to, to, to be a follower of Jesus? And one young man said, you need to pay the tithe. And I can look at that and I knew immediately he was taught, he was brought up in a legalistic uh, church. The love of money was the fork in the road for Jesus and the religious leaders. That is where, that is the point of departure of, with, of Jesus and the rest of them. While Jesus saw money as a means to an end, the the religious leaders saw money as an end in itself. Jesus saw money as a means to keep the temple going and they saw money uh, as the temple itself. It was these events and human reactions that culminated in Jesus' comments at the treasury. We will now look at the widow's offering in finer detail against this contextual backdrop. Jesus commended the widow for her faithfulness, yes. But that is not the whole story. That is not the whole story. Looking at the preceding events, we realize that while the Lord was pleased with the widow's attitude, he took issue with the leaders who made sure that she had this attitude. Okay, let me explain that. You see, Jesus, 
encourages us to give toward the work. Because the Bible says that those that work in the ministry should be paid by the ministry. Do not muzzle the ox that tread, treads the grain, okay, or grinds the corn. He took issue with the leaders, right? And this is what I was saying. Because of the legalistic attitude and tradition that these people converted the Mosaic law into, the widow had to give all she had. And the reason she gave all she had is because that was all that she had. But she had to put the money in because she was afraid that some leader would notice that she hadn't put in any offering that Sabbath day. And if she hadn't put in offering, then somebody might come to her and talk to her and tell her that the reason that she is suffering, the reason that she does not have enough money is because she did not put in her offering. But Jesus looked at her and he saw that when she left the treasury, she was going to be penniless because Jesus saw her take a little money pouch, open it, turn it inside out, pick up the last two coins and drop it in the treasury. And Jesus knew there was nothing left. This lady was going to walk out of there and who knows what she was going to eat that evening or that morning. And Jesus knew that. So Jesus took issue with the leaders because the leaders were enforcing the tithe. They were enforcing an outward form of religion or worship. Now, let me tell you why Jesus felt sorry for this, this widow. In those days, a widow was tantamount to a beggar. A widow was a beggar unless she had sons or male relatives to assist her. Remember, women couldn't work in those days. Women didn't inherit anything in those days. So if she had, if her husband had died and she didn't have sons to work and help her, she was reduced to poverty and begging on the street. Now from the two small copper coins, it was clear that this woman was dirt poor. Yet because of tradition, yet because of her fear of offending the Mosaic law, of offending the leaders of the, uh, of the synagogue, she gave those away. <coughs> Even though she knew she might not have food to eat, she put that money in the offering basket. She gave away the last of her money because she was legally bound to do so by religious tradition. Now somebody asks, well, why did... Somebody will ask, why did the Mosaic Law ask for this? Okay, the Mosaic Law had cop-out clauses or loopholes. Not everybody could, she had to give a ram or a bull for an offering. When you look at the Mosaic Law in total context, you will find, or in totality, you will find that what God was saying there, you give as you can. Those who can give more, gave more. Those who had nothing to give, gave nothing. Remember, you could, you could offer a bull, a, a bull or a bullock, that is a, that is a cow, for your sins, or a sheep, or even a turtle dove, or even grain. So you could give anything. But these people had, start, had, turned, had turned sacrifice into money. And they were interested in money, very much like most of our churches nowadays. I'm sorry, I'm indicting you churches, I'm indicting you pastors, but this is what you preach. And you need to stop doing this. You don't like it, call me, we'll talk. You see, God is more interested in your money, I mean in your life, than your money. Yes, God is interested in your money because it is an asset, it is a means to an end, and God likes you and He tries to help you to manage your money properly. But he's more interested in eternal life in your treasure than your money, your treasure that you have up there. Now, the religious leaders who love money forced even the poor to pay the last few cents they had. They forced them by tradition. They would, ex they would, uh, they would uh, excommunicate them, as it were. Maybe not overtly or uh, openly, but 
subtly. And even nowadays, I've heard of many people that say that when they were earning well, the pastor was very close to them. But when they couldn't pay their time and they were battling and the time dropped, he had less time for them. So that is something that carried over and it needs to be broken. It's a spirit of evil. It's a spirit of mammon that has to be broken in the churches that we live in and we, and we worship in today. Giving had become a tradition instead of a free will offering which God instituted it as. Jesus came back. When Jesus came down, he made sure we know this. He emphasized that it's of free will through his servants and their teachings. Now the widow felt compelled to give. And that is the other side of the coin, as it were, to, to use the pun. The widow felt she had to give even if it meant she didn't eat. Perhaps she believed that she would be cursed if she did not give. Because many people use the, the verses in Malachi 3 and they say that you are robbing God. You are robbing God if you don't give. And basically when you read that, God in Malachi is not talking to the people. He's talking to the priests. He's talking to the very people that misuse the scripture. Now, you will find that even in the Bible, there's a place where Jesus says, some young people, they give their money to the church and they tell their parents, if I didn't have to give it to the church, I would have given it to you. But God is saying that charity begins at home. The Lord says, you can't, go, don't go and give your money in the church if you're not taking care of your mother and father who took care of you all their life. Don't do these things for uh, acknowledgement by men. Do it because it is the right thing to do. You give to the work of God because the work of God needs money to progress. You make sure that you take care of your children, your wife, your, your family, your parents. And then make sure you also got enough to eat before you give money into the church. In other words, what I'm saying to you is, I'm not telling you that you must buy caviar now. You have caviar with your money and then say, oh, but I didn't have money to give to the church. Or go out every weekend and spend thousands of rands a month or hundreds of uh, hundreds of rands a month on meals outside the home and say, no, but I, I want to have to eat. So I couldn't give the church. I'm talking about give unto God what is God's. The tenth that was in the Old Testament, actually it's more than tenth, it's actually 20%. 22%, I think, if I worked it out correctly. That is just a guide. That was giving from the, by the law, which you were bound to do. Now you're living in a period of grace, a period of love. If you give to the Lord, you should give more cheerfully, not out of compulsion. And love dictates, or love calls or promotes greater giving. Now again, I'm not preaching that you must give lots of money to the church. But as God blesses you, the Bible says, you must give. But make sure that you take care of the other things. And don't just focus on money like the, the, the priest did and neglect the widows, neglect the homeless, the, the fatherless and the orphans. That's what Jesus was saying here. He said to you, scribes and Pharisees, you make sure that even the widows put their money into the offering. But you don't use that money to help them. Is that money not there to help those say, poor people? It is there to help those poor people. So give it to them. Okay. Thank you. It was easy for, uh, sorry. The religious bigots desired sacrifice before mercy. God desires mercy before sacrifice. Hosea 6.6. 6. So should we give to the work of God? Yes, we must give to about the kingdom. For it is necessary. However, we must give voluntary out of love for God. Not out of compulsion to man or to a tradition or to a law. Our love must compel us to support God's kingdom of earth, on earth. But we must not give at the... At the at the uh, expense of our own, uh, you know, basic needs, okay? And again, I'm saying, 
Don't drive around in a Mercedes or a BMW and tell me I don't have money to give to the church because I bought this car. It is not necessary. A, a, a Toyota Corolla would, be this, would, be, uh, would do the job equally or even better. The law required a tenth. But while the law does not stipulate a percentage, one should give as they are blessed. In closing, leaders, beware that you do not compel your people to give out of a wrong motive. Do not create widows like this widow. Do not create widows who feel compelled to give the last cent, give all their living. Take care of them because the money that comes into your offerings is for them. It's not for you to, to get a big salary every, every year, a big increase every year. It's not for you to drive in a best car or have a second car. You get one car, the other car you buy yourself from, from your salary and stop trying to, to, to motivate the churches into blessing you and people into blessing you so that you live a great life on church, uh, on this earth, because that will be your best life now and you will never have a good life in heaven. I guarantee that. Do that and see. When you get to heaven, you'll find that you won't even get to heaven. You'll go past it. People of God. Do not give out of a wrong motivation. Do not believe people who says that the more you give, the more you get. Do not believe these people who tell you that you must put a seed offering, money offering to get something. Both practices fall foul of the Lord's word. And that, my friends, today is the truth behind the widow's offering. We trust you've enjoyed God's word and it has been a blessing to you. Yes, I know it was strong, but I know it's a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Remember, we are live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless you.